Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. I'm thrilled to be joined with by uh, Arnold Vandenberg today. As always, nothing here is investment advice, and this is all for educational purposes only. Nothing in this program will be an invitation or solicitation to buy or sell any security uh, discussed. And I hope you all enjoy. Arnold is an incredible person and an incredible investor. So, uh, Arnold, how are you doing today? Very good. Um, I was uh, hoping that we could get a little bit of your life background, and then we'll get into the investment stuff after a, a nice discussion. How's that sound? Very good. All right. So if you want to give people a sense of where you were born and uh, how you grew up, maybe that's a good place to start, and I'll, I'll try to help you along. Okay, very good. <clears throat> well, I was born in Amsterdam, Holland in 1939. And the reason our family ended up in Holland is that my dad was born in Germany. My mom was born in Poland. They met there. They got married in 1933. And by that time, Hitler was coming to power. And my dad figured out that that might not be a great place for a Jewish family to continue staying there. So he immigrated to Holland. And shortly after that, my mom joined him as well. And so they were in Holland. And I was, my brother was born in 1936. Uh, I was born in 1939. And by that time, it was very apparent that uh, Germany was already reaching out to other countries. And it was only a matter of time before Germany invaded Holland. So most of the Jews went into hiding. I was born on the same street as Anne Frank. Uh, I think we lived in the 800 block. She lived in the 200 block. And uh, my family went into hiding just as Anne Frank's family did. They were hidden in an attic and my mom and dad were hidden by uh, Hank and Marie Bunt, the Dutch family who risked their life for hiding them. And they built a little wall behind the closet so that you enter in at the bottom of the closet, the clothes hung there. And then there was a wall there and uh, they could hide there. It was just a little space to stand, not much room. The only time they spent there was when the Germans were coming in the neighborhood and searching it and so forth. And sometimes they'd have to be there for a long time because you never knew when they would come knocking on the door. And the problem developed that they had two little kids. I was two and a half. My brother Zig was five and a half. And it's kind of hard to keep uh, two small kids quiet, especially me, and nothing has ever changed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, they kind of brainstormed it with the Bunce family and other people, and they finally came up with a solution that the uh, Dutch underground was willing to send a girl who was 17 years old for all my life. I thought she was 19, but William Green did the research and found out that she was 17. Anyway, uh, she uh, uh, agreed to smuggle me through the German lines, which was very risky. And the reason was that they checked passport. We didn't have a passport. And so the Dutch underground made fake passports. And the problem was it wasn't very sophisticated. So if you really look closely, you could tell it wasn't real. And so that was a problem. So we had to get on the train. And once you get on the train, the, the German officer comes, checks your passport, and then the whistle blows, he gets off, and the train goes on. Well, what they did is they put a person, a man, in front of us to keep the German officer busy, hopefully long enough to where he didn't have to check her passport, asking him questions, talking to him, he could talk German and so forth. Well, it was very successful because she said she was sitting there and all of a sudden the whistle blew and he said, I gotta go and he jumped off the train and she said her heart was beating. She thought it was gonna jump out of her chest. It was so scary. But anyway, we got to the orphanage and uh, so I landed in the orphanage, and the problem was that my folks were supposed to get a phone call when I arrived, which never happened. And so my mom kept pushing my dad, we got to go out and find a place where there's a phone so we can call to see if he came because 
nobody called. And uh, so that went on for hours. And my dad says, look, we can't go on the street because if they catch us, the kids aren't going to have any parents. So that worked for a while. And then my dad says he couldn't hold her off anymore. If you knew my mom, you'd know why. And uh, so he said, she, she told him, you go. If you don't go with me, I'm going alone. But I'm going. So he said, what could I do, right? So he said he had a very bad feeling about it. And he knew it was way too risky to do. But so I said, how could you let her do that? He says, have you ever argued with your mom? <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, I know what you mean now. Anyway, uh, they went outside. There was an air a raid. They dodged into a little grocery store, uh, kind of a butcher shop like. And the people knew they were Jewish, that my folks were Jewish. So uh, they called the Gestapo. And by the time my folks walked out of the deal, the Gestapo was waiting for them. Uh, they arrested him. They never found out that we got there. And then they took him to Westerbrook, which was kind of a holding tank where they round up all the Dutch Jews and then they ship him to Auschwitz. And the trip to Auschwitz was about three days of hell. There was no food, very little water, and no toilets. So what they had on the train was just a bucket. And men and women had to go there for three days. You can imagine it spilled over, it smelled. And they would just hold clothes up, a uh, coat or something, while they were going. So it was a horrible thing. But when they got to Auschwitz, it even got worse. That's, I mean, that's incredible. Uh, it, it's incredible that humans can treat other humans in that way. And it's also oh, you incredible. have no idea how bad they can be. It's just unbelievable. Well, you know, and you, to your point, um, when we had talked earlier about the people that turned your parents in over, you know, I don't know if it was extra rations or something, right? And the dichotomy. Yeah, it was extra rations, and they paid 15 goldens for every Jew they turned in. And so, you know, that's what happened. Yeah, it's it's just such a sad, um, I mean, this is not a new thought, right? But it's such a sad state of the world where two humans can uh, have such, uh, two separate groups of people can have such different reactions and one group can do something so horrible over something that's really incrementally nothing to their life. I mean, I shouldn't say it's nothing, right? A little bit of food, but come on, you're turning in a human, right? Like, and on the other hand, you have this girl who risked her life to, to take you on the train. And I know that that is, um, that's something that you struggled with. What do you think made her make the decision to take you on the, on the train? You know, Bill, I struggled with that for over 20 years. I thought, how could this girl, 17 years old, I was thinking about when my daughters were 17 years old, could I send them on this mission of suicide? So I th struggled with that. And on one side, you have a family that risked their lives and to save somebody. And the other side, you have somebody who turns in for a food ration. So I struggled with that. And, you know, I graduated, came to America, graduated from high school, uh, got married to my high school sweetheart, and then I got a divorce. And I went into a deep depression. And I went to see a psychiatrist. And we talked about that problem. How could you do that? And he said, Oh, that's simple. I said, it's simple. I've been struggling with this all my life. And he said, Well, here's the way it works. If your principles are more important than your life, you sacrifice your life. If your life is more important than your principles, you sacrifice your principles. So it's a matter of attitude and belief and faith. And these people were deep Christians. Not only did the daughter risk her life, but the father risked his daughter's life, and he risked his whole family's life by hiding Jews in his home. He was a minister. So it was deep Christian faith that allowed them to do it, and it was their principles that that carried them through that. How uh, how through your life have you applied that lesson and developed the principles that you've developed? I mean, it's uh, getting to know you through this process has been uh, a joy more than I. 
even thought that it would be. I knew it would be, right? But talking to you, you're, you're uh, you take preparation very seriously. You take humanity very seriously. And one of the things that I said to you when we talked earlier, and I, I sincerely mean it, someone that's been through what you've been through, it would be so easy, I think, to say, you know what? Screw the world. Like, what's the world ever done for me? And you are a giver by nature. How did, how do you think that happened to you? It's changed on that very day when he told me that, because I realized that here, how profound these people were, that due to the faith and belief and their principles, they were willing to do that. So I said to myself, I need to understand that. I need to, because look, if you didn't have principles, you would turn somebody in for a food ration. If you had principles, you were willing to sack your life and look at the difference in people. So that became a real mission for me to understand that. And that has been, that was in my point, a turning point as well as when I went to the psychiatrist and he sort of backed up certain principles that I had already developed from my parents, but he confirmed them. And that was important for me at that stage in my life when I was so depressed to hang on to what I believed. And so that was a turning point. That was a very important point. And I, whenever I give a talk about this, I mentioned that principle because what happens, people don't have to go through life to have their principles tested. Let's say you're working at a company and all of a sudden you see a chance to make some easy money or maybe do something that's not quite right, uh, but you don't have the principles to stop you from doing that. So I realized in order to be successful in life, you have to have principles. We don't all have to agree on what it is, but it has to be in line with universal laws. And if you look at all the different religions, they wouldn't disagree on the principles like the Ten Commandments as an example. But I think it's way deeper than that, Bill. It is mental principle as well. And so uh, the New Testament Christ thought a lot about the deeper thought of not just the act, but the thought. And I became a student of the subconscious mind kind of on, on, a, on an element that my dad mentioned. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, my dad was in Auschwitz and he was on a death march. Now, I'm about 158, weigh 158, he, and we're about the same size. He was one inch shorter. He weighed 85 pounds and he went on a death march. It's all skeleton, right? It was sub-zero weather and the snow was halfway up your knees. And the rule was that if you weaken by, you know, kind of grumping down and your knee touched the snow, they beat you. And if you didn't get up, they'd shoot you. And you only had two slices of bread or one slice, the equivalent of our two slices. And the water you got by grabbing the snow off the guy in front of you and melting it in your mouth, you marched 24 hours, no breaks. And, uh, and he, I asked him, Pa, how? And he said, you know, I realized the most important thing is that I couldn't weaken and buckle. Because if I buckled, I'd get beat. And they beat you so bad, you don't want to get out. So I knew I had to keep my legs straight and I had to march. So what I decided to do is I said to myself, Hugo, what's the most important thing you can do on this march? And he said, not fall down, not buckle your knees. So every step I took, I tried to place it, even though it was slippery and icy, I tried to make sure it was locked, my knee was locked. And I wouldn't go down and then I'd move my other leg. And he said, every time I tried to move my leg, I just felt like I couldn't go on. But by just concentrating on that one thing, solely to the exclusion of everything, that means you don't think about how hungry you are, how cold you are, how thirsty you are, how angry you are, how far you had to go. Only one thing, move that leg. And he said, you know, there's something that I can't explain. It comes from the mind, but there's an energy in the mind 
when you focus it. It's kind of like when you're a kid and you took a magnifying glass and you put it to the sun and it could burn the paper. Yeah. But it, otherwise, the sun wouldn't burn the paper. So what you were doing was focusing the mind, focusing the sun. And if you do that, you create energy. And that was his explanation. He said, the second thing is that you thought about your loved ones. You were thinking about wanting to see your wife, wanting to see your children. And that got you through things that you would not normally believe you could do. So those were the two things. So there were a few things that my mom and dad taught me about survival that made me think that there was more to the mind than just what we consciously know. There is something uh, almost spiritual that, uh, that you develop strength. And just like these people who believed in the principle, it was belief, it was faith, it was the belief that it was gonna happen. And they weren't afraid. They just did it because that's the thing to do. They believed it. And so as I was talking to the psychiatrist about these things, I told him about an experience I had. And, uh, and that was, you know, when I got out of the orphanage, I was very weak and skinny. I could barely walk uh, at age six or seven. I was crawling most of the time. And, uh, you know, I wanted to overcome my physical weakness, you know, as a young guy, you know how it is, uh, you don't want to be the weakest, skinniest kid in the group. And so that bothered me a lot. And I also lived in a neighborhood where uh, the culture was kind of violent and fighting and that type of thing. And so I was always getting in, people wanted to fight me because I was an easy prey, right? <laughs> Who, who's going to win? So anyway, that shaped my thinking. And so my brother was, turns out that my brother got smuggled into a farm uh, after we got in the orphanage because they had to remove him because one of his traits was he liked to talk a lot. And again, nothing changed in his life. <laughs> <laughs> it runs in the family. Yeah, it runs in the family. So he was, unlike myself, he was very gregarious. And when the Germans would come through the orphanage, they thought he was a cute kid. They didn't know he was Jewish and, you know, he was outspoken, out, outgoing. And so they gave him rides on tanks and they just thought he was great. Wow. And the people at the orphanage were scared to death because he knew he was Jewish. And if he would have said something, uh, that would have given them the whole orphanage away because a lot of Jewish kids were hidden there. And so they had to move him out. And one night they moved him out without telling me. And the next morning I go up looking for him and I couldn't find him. I was destroyed. That was probably the scariest, worst feeling in my life. And I've never forgotten it. But anyway, uh, he ended up on a farm and on the farm they had food and he had to work on the farm. So he became very strong, unlike myself. So he became a rope climber. There was an event in gymnastics that used to be an Olympic event where you climb a 20 foot rope, you know, those ropes hanging on the gym, 20 yeah, feet. Sure. sure. So that's what I started climbing the ropes and so forth. And uh, I had many different experiences, but I had some mental experiences that I didn't understand, but that transformed me from the weakest kid in the school to a champion in the event. I set the school record. I set the league record. Uh, I won the league three years in a row. I placed uh, ninth in the nation as a high school climber against all college seniors. And uh, I climbed a 20 foot rope in 3.5 seconds. And wow. that was a complete transformation. And I almost didn't understand it, but I thought it was just hard work. Well, when I got to the psychiatrist, he says, oh, you, what you told me you did in training is what we teach Olympic athletes, sports psychologists teach it. You visualize what you're going to do. You repeat it often enough. You work on the technique and you believe you're going to accomplish something. Those are things that are in every textbook. But I didn't even know about the subconscious mind. That, that was not something I understood. I didn't even know we had one. But he said, now, if you take those principles and you apply them to business, same thing's going to happen. 
Huh. My right arm lit up like a Christmas tree. Whenever I hear a truth, I get the feeling on my right arm. Really? It just, yeah, it chills. It just chills up. It's just a distinct feeling. I, when I got that feeling, I said, that's what I'm going to do. That's it. I went home. I lived in a studio apartment. And I said, I'm going to start my business, which is something I wanted to do. And I visualized it. I used to, when I woke up in the morning, I was so afraid when I went to watch this champion to figure out a new style that I was afraid I was going to forget it. So I'd get up every morning at 3.30 in the morning and I would be using my rhythm and climbing the rope in my mind. And one day after about six months of that, constantly visualizing, and I'd sit in class and I could just see myself gliding up the rope. I woke up and I felt like Superman. I'm not kidding you, Bill. I felt like a different person. Huh. And I couldn't wait to get through class. The teachers were driving me nuts, you know. I wanted to get there and test it. So I finally got to the fifth period. I grabbed my coach and I said, Coach, I'm going to break my time today. This is going to be a super day. He said, great, warm up and I'll time you. So I sat down. At the minute I took off, I felt like a different person. I was gliding up there just like I did in my visualization. And it was effortless. I used to have to, you know, really pull down. Or, and when I got to the top, I used to have to go way up and reach way to the top. I almost could hit it with my elbow. Hmm. So uh, the coach is out there looking at his watch. I'm hanging up to 20 feet by one arm. I said, coach, what is it? He said, come on down. So I came down and I said, what is it? He said, you know, this is so good. I thought there was something wrong with the watch. <laughs> and I said, there's the nothing timer. wrong with the watch. I'm going to do it again. And I did it 10 times in a row, hit that same time. And it was just shattering. The whole gym, all the athletes, they just got quiet. They couldn't believe it. And from that day on, the, the, in the ninth grade, I was the fifth guy on the team. And the only reason that's fifth guy is because only four guys went out. Huh. I was so bad that I was yeah, almost yeah, an embarrassment they, yeah, to the team. You, you go, yeah, sure. And the next year I won the championship, broke the school record, and I was off. And I was a changed person. I never was the same from that one day. Huh. So when I explained it to the psychiatrist, he says, this is subconscious programming at its best. And he says, this is what happens to championship athletes. Every one of them has used your technique, but it isn't unique to you. When you have a great desire, you start thinking about it. You start visualizing it. You start dreaming it. And you start becoming it. So this is a great, great principle. And I have been studying the subconscious mind for over 45 years, I've got 506 pages of notes on it. And I have used it, unbelievable things you can do, especially under hypnosis. I, I am a hypnotist, uh, not formally, but I made myself into a hypnotist and I used it on my son. He was an athlete, he was having trouble competing. And we used, it, we used to hypnotize him right before he'd go into the meet on the field. And he became a champion at it and did things that most people didn't believe because he wasn't that big for, for the event. So there's an awful lot, Bill, on the subconscious mind. And I have used it for everything I've ever done. And it actually is like being and having another person. It's like having intuition. It's like having... Uh, the best way I can explain it is that... You get intuition. Everybody has feelings. And, you know, like people, you get this feeling that you should do it. But most people think, well, I can't do this. Where's this coming from? And they sort of ignore it. And the more you ignore it, all of a sudden you lose it. But if you nurture it, then it develops. And you can use it for more and more. You get feelings about things. It helps you stay focused. And one of the things that I learned at the subconscious talks to you is through quotations, through things you read, through things you see, through things you feel. And I'll give you a classic example, and it formed a hobby of 45 years. 
My hobby is collecting quotations, things by great people and accomplished people and good people and people you admire. And I collect the quotation. So one day I had started my business. I even uh, saved up and got enough money. A friend of mine lent me money to get an office. I had a part-time girl. And I had just come from an appointment that was very, very disappointing because it was a lead on a client that I may get. But the client wasn't too impressed because I didn't have any credentials. I didn't have an education. Uh, I didn't have much of a track record, only a little while. And so I didn't get the client. And I thought, and this was about as good a lead as you can get. And so I thought, oh, my, I went back to my business and I was very depressed. And I said, how am I going to build this business when I don't have anything, including I don't have any money? And uh, I was barely making my rent payment at home, let alone my office payment. And all of a sudden, this part-time girl picked up my mail and she had all these annuals reports and all the stuff, stock market research and mail. And she had her arms full and she's going to put it on my desk. And I saw her kind of slipping out and I went to help her and I pushed this one magazine. It made... It was like a gymnastic tumble. It hit, it flipped over and landed this way. And I thought, boy, that's weird. It's kind of a weird tumble, right? Well, I looked at it and it, it was turned over. And on the back, there's a quote by Abraham Lincoln. I will prepare myself and the opportunity will come. And as soon as that hit me, it lit me up. I thought, Answer. I'm spending all my time trying to get new business when I'm not totally prepared for it. So mm. I'm going to devote all my energy mm. to preparing for the business. And when I'm ready, the opportunity will come. And I believed Abraham Lincoln that he really believed that he must have experienced that because he was a self-taught person. And so I didn't worry about getting any more business. I just did nothing but study day and night and do everything I could to prepare. And by golly, the business started moving. No marketing, no selling, just by itself. And I kept that up and it was an amazing lesson. And so what that taught me is the subconscious was talking, was guiding me. And it guided me through that quote. So from then on in, I figured that must be one of the ways the subconscious communicates. So whenever I had a quote that really hit me, I wrote it down. And in my computer, Linda sorts them all. And my, my wife started saving all my quotes for me. And lately, uh, Linda's been doing it. And I think I've got, what, over 5,000 five, over 5, quotes on every subject. And then I made a little book called Timeless Thoughts, and in there I put my favorite quotes. So that is one of the languages, in my opinion. Now, don't quote me because I'm not an expert at this. I don't have any education in this. It's just experience. But by studying the subconscious mind, you learn so much more about yourself. And you know what the Greeks taught? The Greeks taught that the first method of wisdom is to know yourself. So when you know yourself, you can, if you know, it's kind of like if you know how to drive your car, it's easy to drive it. If you don't, you might be making a lot of mistakes. Yeah. So to know yourself is the most important thing in life, in my opinion. Can you talk and, uh, just a little bit about the preparation that you, when you say, I told myself if I prepare, then the opportunity will come. Can you talk about the preparation? How much of the preparation was just strictly finance related? How much of it was working on yourself and knowing yourself in a better way? Like what, what is your definition of preparation? Well, I'll give you an story? example. I became fanatical about it. And by the way, that's the way I am. When I get into something, I go all the way. This is just, that's me. And most of it is out of desperation because I never had any talent. I never, nothing came easy. 
I didn't do well in school. Matter of fact, I flunked out of Hebrew school uh, when I was a little kid, uh, which was equivalent of, of a kindergarten Hebrew school. Yeah. And a rabbi and the, my dad tried to make uh, excuses for me. He said, well, Arnold, uh, I said, how come I'm not going with the other kids? I was just a little kid, you know. Well, you know, we're going to put you in this class. We think it's better for you. But I knew that that wasn't it. I knew that I had failed and that bothered me. And the reason I had a low self image of myself is because after the war, I wasn't doing well at things that required some thinking. So my mom thought maybe because of the war, it affected my mind and malnutrition. So she hired the top child psychologist in Holland that she could find. And he speculated that it might have been because of malnutrition it could affect your brain. And I heard him. And so that gave me the impression I had, you know, was psychologically impaired. I wasn't too smart. So I never tried. And I never did well in school, barely graduated. But anyway, when I went out for the rope climb, I knew that it would take a lot of hard work because I was the worst there was. And so I became fanatical about it. So when I started studying for the market, what I did is I took everything. I lived in a studio apartment, took everything off the wall, nothing on the wall but bookshelves. And I bought every book on the market I could find. And I spent every moment that I wasn't working the market and studying until late at night. And I wouldn't date, except I was single at that time. And I wouldn't date except on the weekends. So one time I met this really great looking gal. We got along real well. And, and so she said to me, why don't you come over Wednesday night and I'll cook you dinner? And I said, oh, no, I can't. I'm studying. She said, you're studying? I didn't know you were taking courses. I said, no, no, I'm not taking a course. I have a program. I bought all these books. And I got to read so many pages a day in order to get to so many books for the month. And then I have so many books. And by the end of the year, I should have read all of these books. I figured it out. And she says, she just couldn't believe it. And she says, what are you studying to be, a monk? <laughs> a monk, I'm studying to be an investment counselor. She goes, oh, and then I said, oh, okay, I got it. That's funny. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's that's how you got to focus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So how did you find – Just mean, side light. Indeed. Well, you're, well so you, you found value, right? You're, you tend to identify yourself as a value manager, right? So how, out of all the books that you're reading, how does the value mindset click with you? Uh, here's what's interesting. Uh you know, when I graduated from high school, I didn't have good grades to go to college. And so I was working in a gas station at buck 15 an hour. And uh, and then I went from the uh, I lost the job at the gas station and I went and worked in this big oil company where I was applying for a job in the mailroom or anything job they had. And they had a job in the print shop. So uh, I got the job in the print shop just to show you how desperate I was. My dad and I got into a hassle. And we, we had some real problems physically, too. But I finally left home uh, when we had a dispute. And I only had about $40, and I called up a friend of mine who wanted to move out, too. So we got this apartment by ourselves. It was $40 a month. This is 50 years ago. And... Uh, Two weeks later, I lost my job at the gas station because they went bankrupt and my transmission in my car went out. Oh. And it was two weeks before Christmas. And I thought, I'm not going back home if I have to live in my car, but obviously I need the money. I had to yeah. sneak around to avoid the landlord because my rent was due. So I went knocking on every door downtown Los Angeles every day, nothing. One day I walk into this, I walk by this building and said, geez, I didn't go into this building. And I thought, well, I've had enough. No, go back in, go into the building. That's one building you missed. So I walked in there and I said, I'm applying for a job. Uh, she, she said, okay, here's an application. And I was so tired of it. I filled out the application real sloppy. The other ones I did 
real neat because they tell you you got to do it. And she said, I just got a phone call from the Multilith department and uh, they need somebody. She said, would you be interested in that? Well, I didn't know what the Multilith department was, but I said, sure. I figured it didn't matter what. Yeah, right? I, I'm interested in anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm interested. So I said, sure. So I sat down with the guy and he said, well, you know, you have a background fixing cars, working in a gas station. I think that would work out. I think you'd work out fine. I still didn't know what he was talking about. So then I go to meet the supervisor of the Multilith department, but it wasn't in the Multilith department. So I couldn't tell. He said, yeah, you know, if you're interested, let me take you down to the department. I'll show you what you'd be doing. I thought, great. And now I get to see what I'm going to be doing. And it was a bunch of printing machines called the Multilith, uh, Dressograph Multigraph. So he said, yeah. Uh, I said, oh, I would love that. And he said, okay. I said, when can I start? He said, oh, Arnold, I could, we couldn't start you right away. We got we to gotta send you to a doctor to get, you know, health test. And then we got to have you fill out the paperwork. And it's pretty close to Christmas. Why don't you come back after Christmas? I said, well, why can't we do it now? And he said, well, I need a report from the doctor. I said, well, how about if I go to the doctor, take the report, and I'll put it in a sealed envelope so I can't open it and the doctor can examine me. And then if I bring it back, it's, he goes, well, I guess that would work. Yeah. So he called the doctor. He could see me. I went down there, got the doctor's exam. So I go rushing back there and I'm all excited. And he opens it up and he goes, oh, no. What's the matter? He says, you're colorblind and you're working in a print shop. <laughs> I, my heart just sank. I thought, oh, my God. So he said he could tell I was really <laughs> upset. So he said, let me give you my own test because I don't care if you're colorblind oh, as long classic. as you can tell the colors of sure. the paper. So there was pink and blue and green and yellow or canary yellow. And, you know, when the color, I was red colorblind, so it's just a shade. I can see the solid colors. So I passed his test on the deal. You know, he says, okay, well, that takes care of that problem. Now all we need to do is get you the paperwork. Maybe you can come back in a couple of days. And I said, Roy, or Mr. Meglin, you know, I really need to get started as soon as I can, because quite frankly, I haven't paid my rent. And he said, oh, okay, I'll tell you what. Come on in here. He got me in his office, filled out the paperwork, got everything. I started the day before Christmas. Huh. And so that shows you when you're desperate and you have a strong desire, you make things happen. So I was so happy the day before Christmas, I got that job. Yeah. You know, when you're telling this story to me, there's there's sort of two different stories that I'm I'm thinking about in your family, and I, and I'm just wondering how much you think of this as genetic versus um, circumstances. And I guess that the the two that I'm thinking about is when your mother approached the guard in Auschwitz uh, to sort of start brokering her business, and then how 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 much tenacity you had in this story that you're that you're telling, it's so many people would not have gone in the building to start with. And then so many people would have said, you know what? Okay. I'll wait until the doctor is going to, uh, you know, be able to see me. And then so many people also would have said, okay, I'll wait. Like, what do you think it's genetic that you're, there's something that comes from your mom that is just like a problem solver in you? Well, I'll tell you what I think it is. I'm sure it's a little bit of all of that. We all have genetic dispositions, right? But if you read the book, The Biology of Belief, which is the top biologist in the world, he had an epiphany and he realized that belief and need override genes. And he said, if you believe something, you can really change your genes and your DNA. And I would say if I was not very desperate when I was looking for the job, and the guy tells me to come back after Christmas, I come back after Christmas. What's the yeah. big deal? If I would have had money to pay the rent, and if I would have had money to eat, I probably wouldn't have pushed it. So I don't think that's the gene part. I think that's the desperation part. And there's another part. 
if you've ever been hungry, and I have, because we used to go out in the field and eat plants, you know, just for the hunger, you're never going to be the same because that's an instinct you just can't hold back. And that creates a desperation that you can't even imagine. So when I was not being able to pay my rent, not had enough money to eat, well, that creates a, a situation where you do things you have to do. Desperate people do desperate things. Sometimes they're not good things. That's what leads people to crime. Some other people who are desperate and they don't know how to get a job or there's nothing, then they might resort to crime. And so is that genes? Is that genetics? You know, you, this is why you have to understanding, you know, one of the greatest things in life as an achievement, which is another whole story, but just to give you, is to under, to appreciate love, to be able to accept love and to be able to give love. That is the single greatest achievement any human being can aspire. And I have, I have a little article I wrote about it and it gives all the different sources of why that's true. Well, if you have love, it opens up all kinds of other doors, just like anything else. So that's an important part of understanding. And understanding is one of the ingredients of love. You could not love somebody who you didn't understand, who you could, you know, communicate with. So these things are all tied together and are all tied together in the bow of character. And that is crucial, whether you're an athlete, a businessman, or whatever. Matter of fact, when I was studying, I was led to the books by Benjamin Graham. And you know who Benjamin Graham is, right? Oh, yeah. Benjamin Graham is considered the father of security analysts. He was the mentor of Warren Buffett. And everybody in the security fields considers him like the George Washington of the country, you know? Now, in preparing for this interview, I thought, what is the most important thing that I can communicate to your audience that will help them right from this second on? This second on, you can change your life in the twinkling of an eye. And you may not see the results until much later, but mentally you have changed. When I heard that thing about the principle, that changed my life. When I heard that thing about prepare, I will prepare myself the opportunity to come. That was a momentary thing. So when I read Benjamin Graham's thing, and I have the, uh, I pulled him out for this talk. Let me read you a few things that came across Benjamin Graham. Now, don't forget, he went through some very tough times. He managed money during the Depression. Now, if you know anything about money management, that's not the right time to be a money manager. He said, listen to this. So everybody thinks to be a money manager, you got to be very intellectual. You got to be smart. You got to have an MBA. You got to have a CFA. You got to have all these intellectual hurdles that you have to jump. Because if you don't have them, you're just not going to make it. That's not what makes a great money manager, according to him. Not to me, to him. Let me read. Can I take a few minutes to read? Yeah, for sure. For sure. The genuine investor in common stocks does not need a great equipment of brain and knowledge, but he does need some unusual qualities of character. Now, why? Here's why. By developing your discipline and courage, you can refuse to let other people's mood swing govern your financial destiny. In the end, how your investments behave is much less important than how you behave by controlling yourself. It requires strength of character in order to think to, and to act in opposite fashion of the crowd and also patient to wait for opportunities that may be spaced years apart. So here's just talking about mental control and mental courage. Before you place your financial future in the hand of an advisor, it's imperative that you find someone who not only makes you comfortable, but who is honest beyond reach. Character. See? Now, in choosing somebody, that's the most important thing. 
In the world of securities, courage becomes the supreme virtue after adequate knowledge and attested judgment are at hand. Individuals who cannot master their emotions are ill-suited for profit from the investment process. Now, this is all independent of understanding income statement and balance sheets and growth rates and you know debt structures and all of that. This is what you need to become to be the tool that can activate on the investment principles. And if you know all the investment principles, but you're lacking these things, how the hell can you be successful? You know, it's like having a tool and you don't know how to use the tool. Investing isn't about beating others at their game. It's about controlling yourself at your own game. Now, one more. The investor who permits himself to be stampeded or unduly worried by unjustified market declines in his holding is perversely transforming his basic advantage into a disadvantage. Now, here's from a completely other source about character to a man that I have a lot of respect for, and I think most people would agree, Theodore Roosevelt. Character is far more important than intellect in making a man a good citizen or successful at his calling, meaning by character, not only such quality is honest and truthfulness, but courage, perseverance, and self-reliance. So he's just confirming everything that Benjamin Graham said, that you are a incredible precision instrument. You've got a mind and a subconscious mind that can literally move matter. I mean, in quantum physics, which I do not understand, they teach that the mind has the ability to move matter, to influence situation, to change circumstances. And I have experienced these things. Now, if a person wants to make a lot of money, if he wants to be a money manager, or if he wants to just invest his own portfolio, that I believe if I was running a school for teaching people about investment, I would do what the Greeks do. You know, the Greeks spent all this time training their leaders. Up until the age of 35, you became a PhD at age 35. And I have a quote, I won't, I don't have it with me, but I'll quote it for you. It's Plato was talking, they were talking about how do we pick leaders? And he said, let these PhDs, which is where the word comes from, go into the cave of the world. Let them deal with men of cunning and men of brawn. Let them get their philosophical shins kicked on the crude realities of our, the world. Some of our perfect products will break down, but those that survive, scarred and sober, armed with all the tradition that we can give them, these men will become the rulers of the state. So they realize you just can't mint leaders by running them through an MBA program or a law program and not teach them any character. And they developed the Olympics, so these leaders had to go through the school until they were 35 years old. They had to go into the cave of the world for 15 years, which makes them 50. At 50, scarred and sober, armed with all the tradition, these men will become the rulers of the state. Now take a look at our leaders here in, the, in, in government and look at the kind of people you have in there. They would never have made it in the Greek Senate, because they didn't, they had the intellectual capacity, they had the educational capacity, but they're lacking the character. If they were in Holland, some of them would have sold out my parents for some, some extra rations. So what we need is people who have gone through the education, through the experience, and then they become the leaders. Yeah, I, I would say, I, importantly for America, we need that. Less importantly in the market, you need that too, right? Everybody, uh, it seems to me, needs to go through a different market uh, cycle or structure or something like that that tests them in order to figure out who they are and how they'll respond to both good and bad times to figure out you know, whether or not they can get to the other side. It seems to me as though... Um, that has been the value of managers test uh, over the past decade or so, and we'll see we'll see what uh, you know 
comes out of the next decade. It's going to be interesting. You know, value managers, including myself, have been hurt more in the last 10 years than anything. And I even did something that made it even worse. But the one thing that I know and I believe and I would not give up. Matter of fact, I was willing to give it up one time when it wasn't working. I was willing to give up the business rather than my belief. It was 1987, and I could not believe that we had a 20 multiple on the market and 10% interest rates. And my stocks were going up, and they were hitting their overvalued point. I kept selling and selling, and I couldn't find anything to buy. And then all of my clients were getting upset with me because I was in 50% cash, and the market was just ripping away. And I lost clients because of that. And I had a lot of pressure on me. You know, every day seeing, I thought to myself, what if I'm wrong? What if something changes in valuation and the market keeps going? And it really bothered me a lot. And then one day, I, the thought popped into my mind. The subconscious told me, the most important thing is that you do the right thing and what you believe. It might put you out of business, but it's the right thing. Just like you might get killed taking this kid across the border, but that's the right thing to do. So I said, it brought me tremendous peace. I said, okay, as long as I'm doing the right thing and the clients leave or I sell them out, I've done the right thing. And then two weeks later, the market crashed in 23% in one day, 1987 crash. And I was like a kid in a candy shop. I was just pouncing all over. I just couldn't get, I got indigestion. But that's what happens. Now, just think if I would have caved in. Oh, let me give you an example of the pressure you get. I had this guy who recommended me to a new client. He was a young guy. He had a film studio or a video studio and he sold it and he made about $3 million. So he wanted to interview me. It was a CPA. So we met at a CPA office and I showed him, you know, I didn't have an audited track record. I took him a client and showed him. I said, in all these trades, I've only had three stocks that dropped more than 50%. So he's counting all, I brought him all the trades. So he's counting them all down and he found four. And he said, well, there's one problem I have is I hate to hire an investment counselor that can't count, you know, because I told him it was three yeah. and, he, sure. and he was right. He was four. Yeah. And I said, well, you know what? I agree with that. But you know what? I may not be able to count, but I've been averaging 15 percent for the last 10 years. So maybe it's not that important to know how to count. <laughs> So anyway, he gave me the account. So, so anyway, what happened is he starts with me. We opened the account. And the first month, we buy three stocks. All the while, the market is going up. And he keeps pressuring me. What do you mean you can't find any stocks? I bought a mutual fund, and it's up 5%. And you're sitting there in cash, and I've lost money. So the first time, I said, look. This is what I believe. I explained it to you. And, you know, this, he said, okay. So I called one more time. The third time he called, he said, you know, Arnie, I don't think we're going to, we're the right fit. So I'd like to terminate the account. I said, okay. And he said, uh, why don't you give me a discount on the fees? Because you haven't done anything. I said, first of all, let me tell you something. Being in cash in a bull market is not like you're not doing anything. You're aggravating day and night. So it isn't like I'm not doing anything. <laughs> but knowing in my mind, I don't think whatever you pay me, you're going to be happy with. So I'll tell you what. Why don't you take your account and you don't need to pay me anything? Just say gesund, like we say in Jewish, be healthy. And he oh. said, okay, well, that's very generous of you. I don't mind paying you something. I said, no. I don't want you to pay me if you don't think I did anything and I wouldn't feel good about the money. So we're fine. So he left, but that's the kind of pressure you put up with, right? Yeah. So he left and about a year, year and a half later, the broker calls me and he said, you know, Arnie, I don't want to mention the guy's name. 
you remember this guy? I said, oh, yeah, I remember. He said, well, what he did is he sold out of the market when it went down. So he panicked and he lost 23% of his money. And then he went into second uh, mortgages and the real estate market was collapsed. So now he lost in the market. Now he's got his entire net worth in the second mortgages. And I was just wondering if you could give him a call and, uh, you know, maybe you can give him some advice. I said, I'll be happy to call him. I called him. I said, hi, this is so-and-so, Arnold Vandenberg. And he said, oh, yeah, geez, I'm really sorry. And, you know, apologize what happened. I said, look, I feel bad. Uh, is there anything I can do to help you? He said, Arnie, I wish I could sell these things so I could give you the money, but I'm all tied up and I'm underwater and I can't sell at this point. So that's just an example of what Benjamin Graham talks about courage and fortitude and resilience and sticking with it because at times you can literally feel like an idiot when you're that wrong when everybody else is right until the curtain changes, you know? Yeah. But you got to be able to do that. I got to ask a follow-up just based on current market conditions. You had mentioned that you didn't like the market at a 20 PE with the treasury at 10%. Do you view, you know, a 30 PE when the treasury is at 1% as any different or one and a half percent now? Like, was it the inversion of those, you know, that, because in theory, it should, the spread should not be that great, especially when the treasury is higher than the market, you know. Well, that's a huge difference. I mean, yeah. think about it. If you got a, uh, if you got a market that's at 22, you're making less than 5% and yeah, you can get 10% right. in a bond, without taking any risk. So yeah. that's a huge difference, right? But today, if you have a 2% interest rate, you know, you're only making 2% and you could make that much in the market, you know, at the 22 level, make 5% or 4% and you have some growth. I'm not justifying this market, but it's totally different. And yeah. I think that's a very, very good question. Most people don't realize this, that the market is not as overvalued as many people have thought. Now, having said that, there are pockets of bubbles, like you mentioned in the real estate business, and there are pockets in the technology. I wouldn't say the market is cheap, and I'll tell you why I don't think it's cheap. Based, if interest rates were to stay at one and a half to 2%, I could live with this market because I'm getting four or 5% on a stock, right? And you're getting one and a half to 2% on the treasury bond, that's okay. But the problem is, the question we have is, is it going to stay that way? Yeah. Is interest rates gonna stay this low? If they stayed that low, I, I wouldn't be as concerned. But if interest rates go up because of inflation, and all of a sudden, you know what the average interest rates on the BAA is about six or 7%, they're earning 5% today. now. What do you think would happen if interest rates went to five or six percent? The market would sell at 16, 17, 18 times earnings instead of 22, and you'd have a 30 to 40 percent drop. You know, now, I, this is different, but it's similar, Arnie. I, I was just looking at, a, at the house that I talked to you about. We had rented it, and I just saw what it was listed for, and I thought to myself, it, it's a different, but it's very, it's a related thought. I thought, boy, you know. This price that people are paying can make sense if you're running like a debt service cash on cash calculation. But boy, if it re-rates on you and it's a levered asset, it is going to be painful. And you're picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. Right. We don't know, but you don't know what's going to happen in the future. What I would say is I lived through the 70s uh, during the 70s in inflation and I had read about the inflation and so forth. Matter of fact, for anybody who's interested in understanding inflation, the Richmond Fed, Richmond, Virginia Fed, made a study after the 70s inflation where inflation got to 18, 19%. And they came to the conclusion, they wrote a beautiful article and they quoted uh, Arthur Burns, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve in the 70s, and he was an inflation hawk. And he gave a speech when he retired, and he called it the, uh, the confession of an investment banker. 
And he said, when I made the statement that it's illusionary to expect the Fed to stop inflation, I did not mean that they couldn't do it, but I meant that they could not practically do it for political reasons. Hmm. And at that time, the discretionary uh, cost of the government was around 40%. Discretionary meaning, uh, or rather mandatory expenses were 60, 40% and the discretionary were 60. So you had a lot of room to cut, but not much. Today, the, the mandatory expenses are so great, if they wanted to cut expenses to get the deficit down to reduce inflation, there's nowhere to cut. You can't cut Social Security. You can't cut unemployment. You can't cut entitlement. You can't cut any of these things. So how are they going to stop the inflation once it starts? So that's the big problem today. And that's why I believe, and don't quote me, it's just me, I believe we are in a commodity bull market. Whether we have inflation or not, the inflation will add to the bull market, but it's there. And the reason is that we have not invested in commodities for the last 10 years. Everybody's in the S&P and nobody wants to fund commodity companies and gold companies and silver and food companies and all that. So it's underinvested. And now as the demand goes up and we're underinvested, you're going to get shortages yeah. like we're seeing in the chip, right? So if we get shortages, what happens? The price goes up, right? That causes inflation. And what happens if inflation goes up? The interest rates go up. Now, there's two sides of the coin, as always. Mr. Powell, the Federal Reserve, and Janet Yellen feel that inflation is transitory. And you know what? It's possible. I'm not ruling it out. I always take the approach. I read both sides, and I kind of figure out what's going on, depending on who's got the best argument, just like in a trial. However... What they may not realize is that there's such an underinvested in commodities that the prices go up not because of inflation, they go up because of shortages. Now, let me give you a classic example. You know the big thing with the electric vehicles, right? Yep. Everybody thinks that's the future and so on and so forth. It's going to eliminate fossil fuels and all of this other nonsense. The electric vehicles are not going to eliminate fossil fuel. And I can give you many reasons, but let's just hold that for now. But many investments are needed for the electric vehicle. 40% of the cost of electric vehicle is, guess what? The battery. Well, what's in the battery? Cobalt, lithium, graphene, uh, copper, aluminum. I mean, huge amounts. Now, we figured out, but I'm sorry, I didn't figure out. People have figured out, one of, I hired one of the top guys in the field, and they figured out that if you were to replace the internal combustion with the 216 number of cars on the road, the amount of copper would need it, it would be nine years of production. Right now, copper production is going down and it takes nine years to get a permit to get a, a, a copper mine built, to get it going. So how are these electric vehicle sales are going to continue when all of these uh, commodities that I mentioned are in such short supply? Some would take hundreds of years, take hundreds of years to get the amount of production needed to fit all the electric cars. Now, the argument against it is, well, they're not going to replace the whole fleet. They're only going to place one third. Okay, so it doesn't take 150 years. It takes 50 years. <laughs> yeah, it's still a, it's still a structural shortage. If it's one or another, you're going to have a shortage. Yeah. So what I believe is we don't have to bet on inflation. We just have to, you know, like uh, Benjamin Graham said, don't bet on people's opinion. Don't bet on the prevailing opinion of expert. Just bet on the arithmetic. Yeah. Now, let's do the arithmetic on the commodities and look how much is needed. And you're going to know we're in a bull market. And the biggest bull market is in oil. And we invested in oil. We're very big in it. And we got hurt real bad. We got in early. 
and it went way down and everybody thought we're an idiot and people left because of it. We had all kinds of, just, just the opposite. I went 87. But when you have the conviction that there's no way out other than it to happen, but it might take five years, boy, that's a lonely place to be, is to be in something to be wrong three to five years. Well, we were wrong probably about two or three years. And finally, this last year, oil went from $15 to 60. And our stocks are really starting to pay off and they even have a bigger part to play down, play out because the things got so negative in the oil industry. Everybody's against it because ESG, because electric vehicle, renewable energy, all of these, I should introduce my, one of my favorite words to you and your audience. It's a Jewish word called bubamise. You know what it means? I, I can guess. I don't know what it means, but well, in <laughs> Texas, like a... <laughs> if you walk into a cow pasture and you step in something that smells, that's what it means. I okay? was going to say it's bullshit. instead of saying that, <laughs> I say bubamise. In Jewish, it means it's Hansel and Gretel tales, or Cinderella, or you believe in the tooth fairy. Okay, so I like that. Uh, so when you listen to all this stuff about the oil industry going away and fossil fuels being replaced. That is bubble mice. Yeah. And the way I can explain it is that 84% of the energy created in the world is through fossil fuel and only five to 6% are through solar and wind. That's number one. So you're not going to replace 70 to 80% of the oil through electric vehicles because they're only 20 to 30% of the pie to begin with. And they're not all going to be replaced. It's going to be about 145 million cars on the road in the next nine years, 2030. But here's the key. We only, with all about electric vehicles, we only have 5.6 on the road. And it takes 33 million electric cars to eliminate 1 million barrels of oil. Now, we need 100 million barrels a day. So if you have 33 million cars, let's say it takes two or three years, we'll have 33 million cars. It eliminates 1 million barrel of oil. But guess what? The depletion in the oil wells goes down 5 million barrel a day every year. So that means we're going to have 5 million less. And so the electric cars are not going to make any difference because they're only going to eliminate 4% of the oil in nine years, which is a half a percent a year. So we know that oil isn't going to be eliminated. So that's the first thing that gives you the conviction. You're not doing without fossil fuel. Might be decreased, but also is the production is decreasing. And by the way, the shale production to this date is actually going down, not up. So if you lose 5 million to depletion, if you don't produce 5 million more the next year, you're going to have a shortage. I believe we're going to have a shortage in fossil fuel in the next few years. Now, the second thing to invest is when you invest into companies, you want to make sure that they're going to be able to survive. Well, if fossil fuels are going to survive, we know there are going to be some people left standing, right? They killed 6 million Jews in the concentration camp, but they didn't kill them all. So they can kill some of the oil companies, but they can't kill them all because the world needs fossil fuel. And so what happens is the strongest one will survive. They will pick up the bones of the, the leverage companies, which they're doing, and they will get stronger and they will make money. And if you buy them at a level where oil has to be produced, it costs about $35 to $40 a barrel, right? So when oil goes below that, what happens? Companies are not going to produce oil if they lose money. So if they don't produce then the price goes up because of the fact that they're not producing. And so we made the bet on the fact that renewals weren't going to place fossil fuels. Some of the companies in the oil would survive. And that's what's happening. And that's what it takes. Now, it was that a smart thing to get in early? No. Was it? Why has it happened? Well, when you're a value investor and things get cheap, you buy, buy into it. Yeah. But you never know how cheap is cheap, right? It gets yeah. good. 
So if you buy a house, I give you an example. When we moved to Austin, Texas from California, the reason, one of the reasons we moved, we had many reasons, but we were excited about Texas because Texas was in a huge bear market. The oil bubble had busted and comp homes were selling for $50 a square foot. Every one of my kids was able to buy a home for $150,000, 3,000 square feet. Different time. Yeah, and we bought a home the same rate. So what was exciting about that is you know that if you, if you are looking at a home that is cheaper than it costs to build, you know you can buy it and you know that eventually it has to go up because people quit building homes. And yeah. that's what happened. People quit building homes. The price went up. That's what happens to every commodity. So all of these commodities are down. They've come up quite a bit, but they're still down. And eventually all you need is time. So that's why a value investor wins if he has the courage and the conviction and the belief that he can wait it out. And if you can, you make money. That's how you get rich. Sounds good to me. I, I tend to agree. The only the only wrinkle in it that I don't know um, is I, I worry that the inflation... Um, I'm going to use the word narrative. I don't want to say that it's, I, I don't know that narrative is the right word, but it's the only one that's coming into my head is a little bit overplayed at the moment because we're on the back end of shutting the entire world down for a pandemic. So production artificially stopped, but consumption did not. Um, so I just, I kind of wonder how much of these shortages are structural versus sort of a one big cycle. But, I have opened my mind up recently to the idea that there's been so much underinvestment in commodities and the industry structures have changed so much that there's a real possibility that we are in the beginning of, like you said, I mean, a five, 10 year bull market. I don't know how long, right? But I had an interesting call with a person at a lumber mill and I said, you know, are you guys he's he doesn't run it so you know he just talks to people in the industry but i said are you looking to or are you hearing that they're looking to expand and his comment back was after the last 10 years of pain no one is is rushing out to go buy a new mill yet uh we're gonna let this sort of see how it plays out for a while exactly one of the things yeah. So when you've been hurt for 10 years, you're not going to go out and do it. So they're going to wait until it really proves. And then finally, it's going to be too late. And they're going to bring them all at the last time. Yeah. But here's the thing. I agree with you. And that's why I'm not making an adamant pitch for inflation. I say there's a good chance that it might. No, there's a good chance it's going to be much longer than people think. But there's also a very good chance that it could be transferred, that it was Temporarily run up, it goes to four to five percent, it comes back down. Let me remind you that during the 70s, that's exactly what people thought, and they never looked back. Let me give mm -hmm. you an example. In uh, December 72, beginning of 73, the inflation was 2.36. A year and a half later, it was 11 to 12 percent. Never looked back. In one year, it doubled, and then it tripled and quadrupled. So that's a historical example. Now, we can examine and say, why did we have inflation in the 70s? And why will we not have it today? But here's the good news. If you bet on commodities, you don't need to have inflation. It's not the inflation. The inflation is, is sort of the, the topping of the cake. The real cake is the fact that there are going to be shortages because people have underinvested what you mentioned first. That's the main driving of the commodities. Now, let me give you an example on inflation, and I made a study of this. I made a chart of when the market peaked in 72 and what happened to inflation. So when inflation went up, the market went down 48%. Commodities as a group doubled. So while the market went down 48%, Commodities went up from 100 to 200 to the CPI, uh, Commodity Research Bureau Index, double. Now, on an individual basis, what was the best performing commodity? Silver, but that was artificial because the Hunt Brothers 
uh, had to try to corner the market. Yeah. Oil went up an average of 33% for the next nine years. Percent went up 30, no, oil went up 38% for nine years. And I can send you the charge and uh, gold went up 33%. Silver went up 56%, but that's artificial. I think the average would have been 23 if it would have gone to a normal price. Oddities in general, if you just bought an unweighted index or an ETF, it would have gone up 22% while the market went down 2%. Hmm. So those people who want to hedge inflation, which would be a disaster for the market, and want to have an alternate investment, I would suggest that they look at uh, the commodity market. But I wouldn't put it in one commodity. I would... And I wouldn't buy the commodities. I would buy the stocks that work in that field, whether it's a copper mine or a gold mine or a silver or, or you know, a farm or any of the things that play to the commodity. I happen to think that the oil market will be a very good place to be. But again, you have to diversify. You wouldn't put all your money in commodities. You wouldn't put all your money in the market. Yeah. Yeah. I love that uh, you're on the the podcast talking about commodities because we're so deep into a cycle where commodities have not worked. Now I say that over the past three months or so they have worked in a big way. I was I was checking out Freeport McMoran's stock price not that long ago, and uh, I, I saw that that's been one that's worked out very nicely. But um, recently I was at Markel. And um, Bob Rabati, among some other value managers, were pitching commodity companies. And if I think through my own portfolio, I have some indirect lumber exposure, but I don't have much else. Uh, and I think that it's been this market cycle where a lot of the mediocre companies from a business quality standpoint have just gotten so punished that it would be hard to argue that I have not. I, I thought about Freeport um, maybe in 2019, and I just said to myself, like, I'm not going to get into that kind of business, right? And, you know, it, if you look back at what the stock's done, it maybe that was the wrong thought. Now, you know, I, I, I'm going to balance that statement against you've got to know where you want to play. Uh, but I think that part of markets is being able to adapt to what's coming next, right? So... Um, how, By the how, way, Benjamin Graham, I didn't mention all of the quotes. Uh, I have about 40 quotes by Benjamin Graham. 16 of them are about character and courage and honesty and so forth. But the other ones are about buying unfavored stocks, stocks in industries that everybody hates, including the people in the field. And oil as an example, has been in a bear market since 2007, while everything else has been in the bull market. So you've got 13 years of bear market. My favorite milestone is when an industry is eight years in a bear market, that's the time mm. you should be in it before that happens, because that's about the time it changes. And there's many steps that make it uh, make it recognizable that it's there, as Benjamin Graham said. And one of the things is when the people in the United States says, yeah, I know it's going up, like the lumber guy says, but I'm not going to be jumping in there and building a plant and then have the price go down and I get stuck with the plant, which is what happened yeah. in the previous few years. Mm -hmm. People were building, uh, were drilling for oil and kept moving up and the supply kept going up and then it went down and then they were stuck. Yeah. So once you get burned... You tend not to do that. And so it takes a lot of discipline to say to yourself, yes, I was wrong the first time. Yes, I was wrong the second time. But the long-term indication is that it's got to go up. And so I'm going to keep buying. Then yeah. as long as you have a limit to what you'll put in, so you don't bury yourself, if you're wrong, then it works out. Yeah, I think the only the only wrinkle in the oil thesis and i i don't i don't know how material it is but it seems to me that shale is predicated upon cheap debt which interest rates have driven riskier behavior in lending 
So at what point do, does the capital start coming back to, into the market? And with so many, um, my perception of the shale industry is a lot of it's private equity owned or through some limited liability companies. Do people try to spin that up again? I'm sorry, which companies are you talking about? I was just thinking about certain certain parts of Texas that I that I have sort of paid attention to, and I I know somebody that worked in there. Um, it seems to me that risk capital uh, is sometimes the the benefit or or the amount of risk capital that's willing to go into the industry is what uh, will be the supply chain uh, the supply uh, constriction, right? Because it doesn't take a whole lot to set up a limited liability company and try to go raise well, the, the a, a special purpose is, vehicle or something like that. Right. Good news is the risk capital is avoiding the, uh, the equity market in oil yeah, because they've been burned so much. The banks yeah. don't want to lend. Uh, the customers are wanting them not to keep drilling. They want them to pay dividends and, and buy back stock. So there's a lot of pressure on the oil industry at the time when they should be expanding the fracking and building it up. The fracking is actually going down. Yeah. Well, the price is going up. It should be the other way around. But eventually it'll change. When people get convinced that the price is going to stay at a certain level, then eventually people will money will come into the market and people will build and so forth. But I think that's still a little ways away. But all, right. all of these are... Definitely, there's always two sides of the coin. Yeah, that's why you got to read the bears and you got to read the bulls. And what I pay particular attention to is what percentage of the stock or industry is short. Because let me tell you something: I have a lot of respect for short sellers, even though they get hurt too. But usually, they're much more thorough. They're much more disciplined. They have to know more about the stock because there's greater risk. There's unlimited risk on the upside. So when I see a lot of uh, shorts in my one of my stocks, it doesn't mean that I would sell it, but it makes me say, hey, somebody knows something that maybe I don't. And if I knew it, maybe I'd change my mind and be a short seller. Yeah. Now, I personally don't short. I don't believe in shorting only because I understand the way the mind works. I don't want to ever have my mind working on negative things. Hmm. Because what it thinks about or perpetuates, it's kind of like uh, Alan Abelson. He used to write for Barron's for 30, 40 years. And he said, really astute observation. He said, I never met a short seller who had a happy childhood. Hmm. They're always negative. They're looking for the negative and they take joy in the negative. But they're usually better security analysts than the long guy. They huh. have to be in order to survive. So they they really are a special breed. I wonder if you could somehow uh, circumvent the negativity by saying, you know, let's say that you're exposing a fraud, and you could you could somehow frame it in your mind as I'm making I'm doing good for society by putting this fraud out of business. Um, I wonder if that would be a way to mentally not get into the trap of of focusing on the negative. But I don't disagree with you. I don't deal with short selling because I don't think I'm good enough to do it. Uh, I find long only. Oh, to that's be hard another enough. reason I don't do it. <laughs> I have only shorted once in my life, but what I got from it, I had a friend of mine as a money manager, and I did everything I could to talk him out of short selling. Not because you can't make money, but being a hedge fund manager, being short and long is probably the most difficult thing to do. I have all the respect for people who can do it. But I think over the long run, you can't do it. And the reason is you're dividing your subconscious mind. There's parts of you saying, I want the economy to get worse and I want the stock to get worse. And on the other part, you're saying, I want the economy to go up and I want the stock to go up. And so your subconscious mind is divided. And what it works on, if you understand the subconscious mind, three things that cover the subconscious mind. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Visualization, visualization, and belief. Now, what do you believe if you're, if you're tightrope walking, right? Yeah. A little bit one way or the other, and you go over. Yeah. So I don't think that somebody who's a student of the subconscious mind would ever be a hedge fund manager. However, with all due respect to them, 
There's a lot of great hedge fund managers, and I have all the respect in the world, especially knowing that they are fighting their own mind. That yeah. takes a lot. Yeah. That's interesting that you say that. I've gotten to know a couple through actually, you know, this podcast and, and whatnot. And um, it is, it's a skill set that I have immense, you know, admir not, I don't want to say admiration, but I really appreciate what they do. Um, it's just not what I'm going to do with my own capital. I've got enough, enough problems uh, being long only, as I said. I think the way to do it is to be a value investor. And by the way, that doesn't mean you don't buy growth stocks. In an environment like we are today, a third of our portfolio actually is in non-traditional value stocks, which you would consider growth stocks. Yeah, uh, They're not at ridiculous multiple relative to the interest They're not the ridiculous kind. But if I didn't have that low interest rates, I would not be in them. Yeah. That, that's so, honestly, when I look at my portfolio, I'm doing the same thing. I look at certain names. I, I think Disney is a name right now that in a different interest rate environment, I would probably be selling. But rich today in a great asset base and where I think they're going, I'm comfortable holding. Now, you know, somebody that is maybe more purist than me might say, well, you're, you're bound to get lower returns from here. And what I would say is not from where I bought it. And I like the asset and I like the strategy. So you know, I think that's the right approach. I, think I you pull forward believe some return. That's OK. By the yeah. way, uh, Bill, I selected, you know, I have been collecting notes in the subconscious mind for the 45 years. And so when you asked me to present in this program, I said to myself, if people are interested in the subconscious mind, in a couple of minutes, what would I want to tell them? Because it helps as Teddy Roosevelt says, in everything you do, I don't care when you want to lose weight or you want to gain weight or you want to run track or you want to go for the Olympic or you want to go for uh, uh, some kind of a achievement, you have to use the subconscious mind. So do you mind if I give you a couple? No, I'd love it. And, th and then I want to talk about um, your mother's uh, foray into the garlic commodity market after we talk about the subconscious mind. Okay, well, that's part of it, but I, I'll tell you. Okay. So, this is an incredible quote, and it's so profound that every time I read it, I think, wow. Sir Arthur Eddington was one of the most prominent and important astrophysicists of his time. He made several significant contributions to the area of physics, he was one of the first physicists who understood the early ideas of relatively along with Einstein. So he was a peer to Einstein. You don't get any closer than that. No, that's pretty good company. So Arthur Ed in his quote is saying, I believe that the mind has the power to affect groups of atoms and even temper with the odds of atomic behavior. Now think about that. And that even the course of the world is not determined by physical laws but may be altered by the volition of human being. Volition means the choice or the will of human being. So right there in that one paragraph, he's telling you that he believes that the mind can affect groups of atom, which affects everything, matter, thoughts, everything. So that's one. Gustav Jung, probably one of the greatest psychologists of the world among let's call them among the top five anyway, claimed that the subconscious mind contains not only all the knowledge that is gathered during the life of the individual, but that in addition, it contains all the wisdom of past ages that by drawing upon its wisdom and power, the individual may possess any good thing of life from health, happiness to riches and success. Now think about that. All the people who have discovered these patents, right? Did they learn them in the classroom in college? No. They learned them by struggling to solve some problem and working at it. And all of a sudden, when they were relaxed in some form, the inspiration came to them instantly. Now, I have read, I, I was even going to collect a quotation of all these people who discovered these pens and show that the way you get to solve a problem is you work at it hard, you put it away because you got to have the subconscious relax. 
Then when you go to it, it comes to you. Let me give you an example. This is Bertrand Russell. You know, he was a philosopher in England. Work on a subject very intensely, then submit it to your conscious mind, subconscious. Speak to it lovingly, instructing it to work on solution. Then go away from it. When you get back to it in a week or a month, you'll find that a lot of the work has been done. Hmm. Now, that actually happened to me by accident one time. Uh, they, there was a group of people who wanted me to give a talk about the subconscious because they know how I use it in sports and on my son. And it was a, a, a college that had a marketing group. And so they asked me if I could give a talk. So I made this talk called The Power of Commitment, that when you commit to something, everything changes. And I had it pretty well worked out, but I couldn't get to the end of it. And I struggled and struggled and struggled and I was not satisfied uh, with the end of it. Finally, one morning at 3.30 in the morning, I woke up and I wrote this and I only changed one word. It was like somebody was dictating. I had a yellow pad and it was just like somebody was dictating it to me. And here's what it said. Remember the thing that governs success in any field is determination. The ability to see something through to a successful conclusion. Yet this is exactly where most people fail. The average person will get discouraged and quit many times short of his goal. What is the difference between an individual who dodgely hangs in or against all reason and hope? It's my belief through personal observation and experience, there's no difference between the individual from a chemical, genetic, or intellectual standpoint. The difference is the person who's likely gave up at the first sign of hardship does not have a well-defined goal. And if he does, he has not impressed it deeply on the subconscious mind. He may want it, but not badly enough to the point where he or she is willing to make it an all-consuming, burning desire. Naturally, if it's a weak desire, it'll be sacrificed at the first sign of hardship. Only a deep commitment, a burning desire, and a sacrificial attitude towards that goal will be deep enough to make an impression on the subconscious mind. If that is accomplished, along with the faith that it can be achieved, you will never lack driver motivation. You will be pulled by a force that will drive you relentlessly towards that goal. It will no longer be necessary to force yourself to do the things you have to do. You will receive energy you did not know you had. Because of these forces, you and you alone will have the power to shape your future. I got to ask you a follow-up. Is this, do you think, a good example of, of you uh implementing something similar in your life is when you write, wrote your wife the check that, that you didn't have the money to cash? Was that one of those moments that was a commitment to your subconscious mind? It was a belief, yes. Yeah. So what happened, as I told you, my wife wanted to help me build a business, and without her, I couldn't have done it. I mean, she deserves all the credit. Nobody backed me more than she. Anyway, uh, we were doing the bills, and every month I was getting deeper in debt. And at that time I was only grossing about $50,000, which is maybe $300,000 a year. But I owed 120,000, which is equivalent to 150,000. And every month we're going deeper in debt, kind of like the government, only the government can print and I couldn't. So, <laughs> so is we were in trouble. So Eileen said to me, you know what Arnold, I see you working day and night. She had tears in her eyes, actually. I said, what's the matter? You have tears in her eyes. Well, I see you working day and night. Every month we're getting deeper in debt. So she was writing the checks for the business. So I can I have one of those checks? I said, sure. So I wrote out the check, $250,000 to Eileen Vandenberg for something you might like. And I said, now don't cash it this week, but one of these days you're going to be able to cash it. And there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to be able to do it and that it was going to happen. It was subconscious. And once you have a subconscious belief, you'll take it to your death. That's what people do. They'll take it to their death. So that's what you got to do, whatever you want to do. But you got to make sure it's the right thing because you don't want to have that kind of will for something that's not going to work out very well, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to have the right principles. 
So let me ask you, you know, the, a lot of a lot of what we're talking about with the subconscious mind and what we have talked about reminds me a little bit of were you familiar with the program The Secret that got kind of popular a little while yeah. ago? <laughs> so that seemed to jump the shark for me. Uh what are what are your perceptions on whether or not that was sort of true or whether or not um, that was marketed in a way that wasn't right? Because I do believe in some of this subconscious stuff. I think that, you know, f- from my perspective, I have I have done pretty well in investing. I mean, I, I have to be honest about that. Um, and <laughs> what? So don't be ashamed of it. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I, I Sometimes I worry whether or not I've, I've gotten a little loose with my principles on it, but I do think closer to reality is my wife says that I'm incredibly hard to live with because I'm just obsessed with this stuff. And like, I think sometimes she wishes that I could just let it go. But I think it is constantly thinking about it is what is a good result. Well, the, the thing about the secret is the secret is that the principles are correct, but it's an abuse of the principles because first of all, The subconscious mind will do anything you want it to do, but it takes time. So when you get people in a room and you charge them hundreds of dollars and tell them, here's the principles, hell, those principles have been around for thousands of years. There's nothing new in the secret. They're just the way they package it. So that's number one. I would give that information away free because it can change people's lives. And I don't even want to get paid for that. That's not important to me. But... They used it as a marketing ploy. The second thing they did is they made you believe that all you had to do was create a vision board and you visualize it, you repeat it to yourself, and lo, one day you wake up and there it is. Now, that's bubble mice. You see, that's, <laughs> that's where you use that word, it's appropriate. Now, yeah. the principles are not bubble mice. You know, if I told you, if you get out and do 100 push-ups a day, you do it for so many days, you're going to wake up with X number of muscles. Yeah, that's right. But how many people are going to do what you tell it to do, right? Yeah, yeah. So none of these things are packaged the right way. That's number one. Number two, the intention, the intention of the individual who was selling it is also important. Because what happened, he actually hurt the cause more than he helped it because he exposed it that he was a sham. Yeah. Okay. Now, now people saying, oh yeah, I've heard that stuff before. It's BS. No, it's not BS, but it takes time and it takes discipline and it takes hard work. That's the real secret. Yeah. It's yeah. not easy. Nothing is easy. Look, uh, i give you a guy that studied the subconscious mind for 50 years. Here's what he said. Uh, In the area of your life, you have a creative power. You can make a mental image or a blueprint of the progress and expansion you want to achieve. And by impressing the content of your objective upon your subconscious mind, you can cause the condition you visualize in your mind to be created. Creative energy is the self-induced action of mind upon itself and within itself. The force behind all progress and achieving is energy. You can have anything you want, providing you're willing to pay the price. Yeah. J.K. Williams, hmm. guy who studied the subconscious for 50 years. Amazing man. Problem is, most people, uh, they ignore that part of the clause that says, provided you're willing to pay the price, right? If anything you want, you pay the price. Now, here's a cute way to d- emphasize that. I can do it in 30 seconds. There was a woman, uh, she started the uh, foundation of... Uh, Christian science, where they believe in curing people through the mind. They don't need doctors and all that. Well, I'm a big fan of Mary Baker Eddy. She was an incredible woman. She had so much faith that she can literally cure people by touching them and healing and pointing the direction. And she thought everybody else could do that too, but they can't, you know. But there are a lot of people who are followers that can't do that. Well, anyway... She had the, 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 the belief that you literally could create everything in your life. And she did. She started this uh, foundation, the Christian Science Church, which I have a lot of respect for. And she started it in her bedroom. You know, hmm. so, yeah, you can create it. You can do it. But 
it takes time, it takes work, it takes disappointment, it takes everything. Now you wanted to know about my mother and constitution. Yeah, the gar- yeah, the, the, well, yeah, the garlic uh, commodity. I I think that. You know, so so there's two things about your mom that I think would be cool to share. One is that story about the um, how she found herself in the garlic trade. And the second was you had said to me that she could sell anything to anybody, but you needed to sell something that you really believed in. Um, and just, you know, those kind of those two stories, I think, if there's okay. a way to weave them. Well, in, the way it nice. started is I graduated from high school barely. I think the only reason I graduated is because I was a good athlete. The coach help, was helpful in that respect. <laughs> but anyway, now just to show you the way people looked upon me, one of my good friends in high school signed my yearbook. He says, Arnold, you're about the coolest guy I know. I hope we'll always be friends. Uh, you're kind of dumb, but you're still cool. So people <laughs> saw me the way I felt about myself, huh. that I wasn't terribly smart. Uh, but anyway, I was sitting here after high school, and now what am I going to do with my life? You know, I've been thinking about rope climbing all during that time. That's all I thought about. Huh. So I looked a little depressed. So, so my mom goes up to me, Arnold, you look a little depressed. I said, well, I am, Mom. She says, so what are you depressed for? I said, well, Mom, everybody tells me that if I don't go to college, I can't be successful but I don't want to go to college because I'm not good at studying and I don't do good in school. She says, what? Listen, there's in the world. There's the business people and the yekka. I said, what's a yekka? She said, a yekka is a guy like your dad. Ask him any question about mathematics, philosophy, English, history, anything. And he can tell you, can he make any money? Nothing, (laughs) nothing. She said, now you ask me, do I know about philosophy? Do I know about religion? Do I know about all of these other things? No. Do I care? No. Do I care about making money? Yes. Manya can make money anywhere, even in Auschwitz. So I said, what do you mean you make money in Auschwitz? She said, well, when I got to Auschwitz, I looked around, it looked pretty dismal. Everybody was skin and bones, and they were feeding us watery soup with a little bit of potato. So I thought, if this is, so I asked the people there, is this all they feed you? Yeah, that's why we're so skinny. So she said, how long you been there? Six months, nine months. She says, I didn't meet anybody that was there for more than a year. So she said, I figured out that I'm not gonna survive more than a year unless I figure out a way to get some more food. So I put my mind to work. How can I make some food? So I got to thinking, the guards were all around us. Maybe if I had something that was really quantifiable, that was valuable, maybe I can make a deal with the guards. But that took some courage because if you pick the wrong guard, you're in the the gas chamber, right? So she said, I studied the guards and I looked for the guys that were kind of old, shoulders were kind of drooped, they had a pot belly, they didn't shine their shoes, the uniform didn't look too sharp. And I figured, that's a guy that maybe make a deal with. The other thing I looked for is, did they have any humanity? I could tell the guy was weak by the way he carried himself, but I didn't know whether he had any goodness in him. So I watched the guys who once showed a little break, give somebody a break when the other guards weren't there or did something human. And I said, this guy's weak and he's got some good in him. He's my man. So then she went to the girls. When you come in, they take uh, your teeth out, of, your gold out of your teeth. They take your wedding rings, you take your watches, they put it all in a pile. They had huge pile of gold and precious metals. And then he had guards standing there with machine guns. And then you had to separate them. Well, nobody was willing to take the risk of pilfering those things because you get shot. I mean, they throw you in the the gas chamber. So she talked to the girls and said, listen, if you guys can sneak out a few diamonds, they said, Manya, what are you going to do with a diamond in Auschwitz? 
She said, that's my job. You get me the diamond, I get you medicine, I get you food, get you anything you want. So the girl says, you're crazy, we're not going to do it. Finally, one of them came up and said, Manya, I, I, I'm going to do it. So anyway, she started trading in that. She went up to this girl, uh, guard and said, uh, does your wife like diamonds? Now, what kind of question is that, right? So he said, well, of course. She said, you know, I, I appreciate you being nice to us. And just, I'm going to get your diamond. So she gave him the diamond. She didn't ask him for anything. The next day he said, Manya, my wife was so happy with the diamond. What can I do for you? She said, well, I'd like some food and medicine. Uh, I got to give that to the girl that got me the diamond. He said, okay. So they started trading that. Then the other thing that came out in Eastern Europe, the Russians used garlic as an antibiotic, like uh, penicillin. And the garlic has 70 properties of healing. It's one of the greatest healing things you can do. The Russian army uses garlic as, as a penicillin. And so that became a valuable thing in the concentration camp because when people got sick, they wanted to use the garlic to get better. There's no medicine. So people started asking. So she started trading garlic. And the lady that is still alive, uh, who I just talked to a few weeks ago, had told me in the past that your mother started trading garlic and all night long people would come up, can you get us some garlic? Can you get us some garlic? And she would hoard the garlic while my mom was out doing business. So she started making a market in garlic. She told me that my mom made the market in garlic. If you wanted to get garlic for, as a prisoner, you had to go through money. Well, my mom got so good at it that she smuggled, she had a German guard from the men's prison smuggle food to the, from the women's prison to the men's prison to my dad, smuggle food through a German guard who she bought off. But one day my dad's sitting there and this guard looks at him and he told his buddy, uh-oh, this guard is looking at us. That's never good news. So he finally came up to him and said, are you you going? He said, yes. He pulls out his briefcase. I have a present for your wife. He said, for my wife? He said, yeah, isn't her name Manya? He said, yeah. He says, well, she sent you some food. So he didn't know what to think. He thought maybe the guy was playing a trick on him, you know? So he said, by the way, what is your Hebrew name? And my dad said, hi. He says, my dad says, can I ask you why you need my Hebrew name? He said, your wife doesn't pay us until we have proof of delivery. <laughs> A good business well, now you woman. know a little bit about the kind of woman she was. My That's dad right. said, he, he said, only Manya could pull something off like that. It was just unbelievable. But she was fearless. She really was fearless. You know, another um, story that I thought you've told me that, that I really think demonstrates the power of the mind is when you said that your dad saw, was it was it two or 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 was it multiple, like really big, strong guys? And they were, they had passed away within a couple, what was it, months or weeks or whatever? But it, uh, how, what happened how long is, your dad made it versus what, you know, they did not, right? Um, and, and I want to reduce it to just like the power of the mind because a lot of things happened there. So, but oh, well, let me tell you what, what happened. There were a bunch of German, Russian, German, soldier prisoners that they threw into Auschwitz. They had no other place to put them. So they were big, strong guys. You know, my dad was 85 pounds at the time. And in addition to that, they could lay out a little blanket, go to sleep in the snow when it was sub-zero weather, and they would be fine. So my dad got to talk to him and says, man, you guys are really strong. It's just amazing. My dad says when he went to shovel, to, he was so weak that when the when the dirt was mud, you know how hard it is to pick it up with a shovel when it's wet. These guys were going like this. So the guy was asking him questions about it. He says, look, don't worry about it. You're going to survive. The war will end one day. The strength that you guys have, don't worry about it. And he thought they would last forever. He says, well, after about five or six months, they were look like him. You know, they were just skin and bone. They lost their strength. But more importantly, they lost their will. And that bothered my dad for a long time. How come these guys don't have the will? Well, it turns out most of them were single. 
They didn't have wives. They didn't have kids. They didn't have anything to want to put up with that kind of torture. Now, the real secret came that my dad said the thing that made it click for him is that he had a friend of his, and he said, Hugo, I finally figured this German scheme out. They're going to starve us and work us to death to get the maximum work out of us. Then they're going to gas us when we can't work anymore. And then they have a new crew come in. The trains were coming in all the time with more new Jews. So he said, there's no point in us putting up with this torture of standing in sub-zero weather in roll call for hours at a time, working in the cold, sleeping in the cold, starving all the... What's the point? My dad said, if you think that way, you're not going to be able to make it. And he said, I don't care. That's it. The next morning, he was dead. Hmm. So what kept him going was, now, if you talk to Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist in Auschwitz, he was on the death march, same death march my dad was in, but they didn't know each other. But on his book, Man's Search for Meeting, on page 73, I'll never forget it, he said that he was on the march struggling away and one of the guys next to him said, you know what, Victor, I wonder how our wives are doing. I hope they're doing better than we are. He said, that got me to thinking about my wife. He said, as I thought about her, the more I thought about her, I got the feeling she was actually there. And we carried on a conversation. I saw her smile. It was just like she was there. And he said, a thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I realized that the most important thing in life is to experience love and to be able to receive and give it. And he said, then the thought occurred to me that even in a desolate place like Auschwitz, a man can experience pure bliss in the contemplation of those they love. Hmm. So that's the secret. It isn't the strength. It isn't the will, it's the love that gives you that strength. And these young guys didn't have that. Yeah, I, I don't, um, I, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question without minimizing the power of, of that statement. I, I think I'm, my question is, uh, this is an investing program and, and the majority of the people that listen are younger males, not young, right, but 40 and under. Um, inevitably there's going to be down periods in careers, right? And inevitably there's going to be in life. That's right. So how have you been able to apply some of these lessons and and get yourself through some of I mean, some of life's worst periods and then also some of the investment underperformance? Like what what advice would you give to young people? Is it find love? Is it work on your mind? Is it a combination of all these things? I think the first thing you have to do, and, and I can give people plenty of reasons, the first thing you have to understand is what's the most important thing in life. When I first started in the investment business was good performance and make money. That's what clients want. That's the most important thing. And then as I evolved, I realized there was a lot more to it and, and with the subconscious mind. And then I realized uh, there's a guy named Samuel Montague who studied what makes people happy for 50 years? And they asked him, why would you spend 50 years studying what made people happy? He said, because I was so profoundly unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't mean said, to laugh. It's kind of sad, but it's, yeah, it makes it's a true. Lot of sense, it's a very right? honest answer. Yeah. So he said, the one thing I've learned, he studied anthropology, psychology, social, everything to do with human beings. He said, the single most important thing physiologically is that a human being needs love. And he said, I can show it in your x-ray, in your bones, and in your body. And if you don't have that, you don't have much of anything else. So when I came to the conclusion that that was the most important thing, then that became also a focus of mine. And when you study the ingredients of love, it isn't just romantic or feeling or anything else. It's a lot of the things that make up character. Like if you read in 1 Corinthians uh, 13 chapter, which you hear at every 
Christian wedding, though I speak with the tongues of man and have not charity or love, I'm like a, a tingling cymbal and an empty gong. And though I give all my goods to feed the poor and have not love, I am nothing. And though I learn all the prophecies and can do everything and so on and so forth, and have not love, I'm nothing. But here ends the three things, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. But in that chapter, he talks about all the ingredients of love. And there are nine ingredients of love, patience, courage, a lot of the things you see in character. So character and love are intertwined. And so a young guy, I would say, I would... Whatever my career is, I would practice discipline, athletics. I would do athletics, whether it's in your home or in your gym. I use yoga. I think it's one of the greatest things you can do, but that's my opinion. And I would study the subconscious mind, and I would, I would practice love. So how do you practice love? So Samuel Montague said, now comes the crucial question. What if you're not as loving a person as you have it in your ability to be? Then you act like a loving person. It's not what you say, it's not what you think, but it's what you do. And once you do that enough, you'll wake up one day and find out you're a loving person. So you practice discipline, you understand the human mind and the body, and you practice love. And all of these things will just expand the horizon. It's just wonderful. And you and part of love is forgiveness. And by the way, that was the hardest thing I had to practice, forgiving the Germans. You know, they killed 39 members of my family and put my family through hell. That's not an easy thing to do. But through work on my mind, I forgive them. And when I forgave them, it was like a, a weight lifted off because... Let me give you a reason why. You have 12,000 to 70,000 thoughts a day. Think about that. Now, if you're angry, you're feeding your subconscious mind negative thoughts. If you're resentful, you're feeding your brain negative thoughts. But if you've forgiven them, you actually start to love them. And one woman who was a very spiritual woman who I met, who's the mother of a friend of mine from high school, we're still friends. When my wife left me for another guy, which to, as you know, as a male ego, that's not an easy thing to swallow. I was very upset about that. And she said, she wrote me a letter and it's one of the most beautiful letters. It took me 20 years to appreciate it. And I give it out to anybody who's gone through a divorce or a breakup, romantic breakout. And there's even a quote by Carl Jung, which I wish I would have known. Hmm. Don't hang on to the person that's leaving because it keeps you from meeting the one that's coming. So you have to clear your mind. So you have to forgive. So she said, if you pray for her, you'll be able to get rid of your anger because when you pray for somebody, you know, it's like being grateful. You can't be unhappy if you're grateful, right? So it's a discipline. So she wrote that letter, and I was even going to write her back, and I thought, this woman has lost her marbles. She wants me to pray for her yeah. and her new husband? Yeah. I mean, you got to be out of your mind, right? But she was right. And when you pray for somebody that you're angry at, it actually gets better and better. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but if you understand the subconscious mind, you know that what you're doing is rewiring your subconscious mind. So all of these things are tied in together. Yeah. No, it makes sense to me. Um, I, you know, I, I, uh, is there anything that you, that you've prepared that you want to, to, um, touch on before we, we wrap it up? I, I have enjoyed, I've enjoyed talking to you so much through the preparation. I've enjoyed this conversation so much, and I think it's got a lot in it for people to digest. And I know that you, we're very concerned about delivering a message to the listener of this program that they could change their life with for a positive, uh, you know, in a positive direction. I think you've given it to them. Uh, so I'd, I'd want to make sure that we cover off on everything. And also if people want to find you, you know, how can they do that? Uh, 
Well, they can. Uh, I uh, I can send you my contact information. Okay. You can give it to them. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, Bill, when you asked me uh, to be interviewed, I thought I always think when I give a talk because I give talks to middle school where. I, they bring me in to teach about the Holocaust, and they have a whole program called Lessons of the Holocaust. And the one thing I always want to say, there were people in my life who taught me things or showed me things that if they hadn't have done it, my life wouldn't have turned out this way. And so I thought, I, in my wall, I have all of the most influential people in my life. It's about a you know, 15, 20-foot wall, and I have all their pictures hanging on the wall because I don't want to ever forget the lessons they taught me, plus the love that they showed for me. And so I said, I always want to do that for other people, because sometimes it's just a little thing that can change your life. And so as I was preparing for this program, I said to myself, when it all comes to, like you say, the bottom line, what is it I want to teach you? And if I can have the 30 seconds to say it, I can say it very quickly. You can take all the time you want. Okay. Well, first of all, every human being, irrespective of whether they've done well or didn't do well or did well and want to do better, the subconscious mind has such an incredible potential that it has greater potential than most computers in the world. That's number one. But it needs to be taught and focused and guided and Cajole, pr promote it. That's number one. Number two, the subconscious mind expresses itself through your body. So when you're feeling pain or you're not feeling good, it's because of thoughts you had before what happened to your physical body. Matter of fact, Candace Pert, one of the greatest biologists of all time, who just recently died in the last five years, said, by all means, a thought can change your body. So when you talk about health and sickness and all that, the most important thing is that what you put in the mind and you're doing it 12,000 to 70,000 times a day. So make sure you put, you know, on the computer, they say garbage in, garbage out. That's with your thoughts. Put good thoughts in there and good thoughts will happen. That's number one. Number one, two, your instrument is not only your mind, it's your body. The body and the mind are connected. In Chinese medicine, they don't separate the mind and the body. They're one. Matter of fact, I was talking to an acupuncturist. My daughter's an acupuncturist. She's a uh, doctor in Chinese medicine. She referred me one time to meet with this acupuncture, Chinese gentleman. And we, I said, what do you people do about the psychology, the mind and all that? He says, we don't have psychologists. He said, it's all ref your mental state is reflected in your body. Hmm. And when your body is not acting well, it means you're not thinking well. That means one of the acupunctures, the chakras are blocked in. And so it's kind of like a dam. If it gets blocked up and you release it, the water keeps flowing. And then the body corrects the mind and the mind corrects the body. So that's been my experience. Whatever you're experiencing, the body, the subconscious mind has a way of talking to you and it talks you through your body. So if you improve your body, you're improving your mind. And when you improve your thinking, you're improving your body. So you are a precision instrument and you got to decide how you want to use it, what you want to accomplish. And uh, Mary Baker Eddy had a great way of explaining that. She said, life is like going to a vending machine. You go to a vending machine, you got 20, 30 items. The first thing you have to do is, what do you want? Of all those 30 things, you want the Coke, you want the candy bar, you want the fruit. What is it you want? Until you decide what you want, you can't get it. If you put in 75%, you're not going to get it. If you put in 25%, you're not going to get it. If you put in 99%, you're not going to get it. You have to pay the full price. And once you decide what you want and you pay the full price, you just got to pull the handle. And there it is. That's it. It's good stuff. I appreciate it. I appreciate your wisdom. I appreciate your time. And uh, I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know you. And uh, I appreciate who you are as a human, man. I, I, 
I don't know too many people that could have gone through what you went through and come out the other side a positive individual. And uh, I think you're the exception to the rule. Well, you know what? I'm the exception to the rule because I've met exceptional people who made a difference in my life, starting off with my coach and many other people through my life. And people like you who are willing to take the time to get this information to other people, that's my pleasure. So it's my pleasure to serve you. And I hope that some of these thoughts will rub off on your audience. As do I. Thank you again. And uh, we'll talk soon. Okay, Ben. Thank you.